When you think of video games, one of the first names that pops into mind is Nintendo. I can't tell you how many times I've been playing a video game, any video game, for any console, and someone walks up and they're like, oh, you're playing some Nintendo? Yeah, this, this right here, this is Nintendo, all right. The reason people jump to that is because Nintendo has had a long-standing reputation of making great games ever since the beginning. Remember this game? Is there anyone out there that doesn't know this game? It's pretty iconic, and it's still widely played today. Nintendo has a lot of beloved series, with several games spanning multiple consoles and handhelds. Perhaps one of the most beloved of these is The Legend of Zelda. So uh, let me level with you for a minute. I love The Legend of Zelda. All of them. Well, most of them. I mean, what's not to love about these games? A wondrous sense of adventure, vast worlds to explore, challenging dungeons to walk through, an evil to overcome, and usually a princess to save. What's not to love about these games? My first experience with the Zelda series was Ocarina of Time. I kinda wish I had started with an earlier game, like A Link to the Past, or even the first couple of games on the NES. I can't even imagine what it must have been like to play these 2D games with all this adventure to action in it, and then suddenly to see it transferred to a huge 3D adventure. It must have been mind-blowing. I mean, one of my first games was Super Mario Bros., so when Mario 64 came out, I was like, holy crap, this is amazing, and I would have loved to experience that for Zelda, but that's fine, I still thought this game was amazing. See, before Ocarina of Time rolled around, most of the games that I had played had been so linear. A single objective to work towards. A single path. The closest thing to an open world I got was Mario 64. And I guess, to an extent, it is kind of open world. The castle doesn't really pull you in one direction or another naturally, other than the number of stars you need to unlock the doors. But that mostly goes away after the first floor anyway. And then once you're in the levels, they're pretty open world too. You can go anywhere and even do most of the stars in any order, and I really loved that about Mario 64. In modern Mario games, you have your different missions, just like Mario 64, but it really moves you along a path you can't stray from too much, and you lose that sense of exploration, but it really fits the Mario mold better. I mean, if you go back and look at the first three Mario games, they were all very linear, and that's what he is, that's what he does. The only reason Mario 64 wasn't as linear was actually due to the limitations that games had at the time. They couldn't fit at all on a Nintendo 64 cartridge, but back to Zelda! I'll never forget my first experience with this game. My friend brought his copy over to play at my house, and when he booted it up, he was Adult Link, and when he first stepped out into Hyrule Field, I was like, holy crap, games can do that? It looked beautiful, so vast, so much to explore, rivers and trees, and a horse? We have a horse too? This game was amazing. It absolutely blew my mind. Watching my friend conquer those temples, work through the massive 3D puzzles, take down enemy after enemy in a unique way, made me fall in love with this game. So like a month later, I see this commercial for The Legend of Zelda, Oracle of Ages and Seasons for the Game Boy Color. Are you kidding me? A Zelda game I can put in my pocket and take with me anywhere? Mine, give it to me, want it? And I got it, for Christmas. Now, I have to admit, I was kinda disappointed that the games didn't look like this. I was only like 11 at the time and didn't understand how video games worked, alright? I was young and foolish, and granted my dreams would later be realized with Majora's Mask 3D, but shh. Zelda game after Zelda game got released and re-released, and I played them all. I fell in love with this series so hard that on my wedding day, my wife walked down the aisle to Ballad of the Goddess from Skyward Sword, and our wedding cake that my wife designed and surprised me with looked like this. Look at it. It's beautiful. It is unquestionably, without a doubt, my absolute favorite video game series of all time. Each one brings something unique to the series. Zelda 1 starts up and thrusts you into adventure, and even with the limited graphics of the day, you can tell there's something wrong here. Almost immediately. Why are people hiding in caves? Why are there monsters everywhere? What happened to this tree? Zelda 2 kind of throws it all at you right off the bat. Zelda's in trouble and traveling around a frustrating world will save her, something. Honestly, I haven't played much of this one. After that came A Link to the Past, a great game that balances story and gameplay really well while letting you explore freely as well. Then Ocarina of Time comes out and WHAM! The entire paradigm of Zelda gets flipped on its head. It was new and fresh in 3D and then something weird happened. Majora's Mask. Now don't get me wrong, I love The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. It's one of my favorite games of all time. Certainly top 3 with Banjo-Tooie and... I don't know, I wrote this before Fallout 4 came out so maybe it's in there too. But Majora's Mask did something that had never been done in a Zelda game before it used the same assets as the game before it. There were some minor cosmetic changes, but all the characters and the ideas from the game before it were used to make a new one. And this set Wind Waker up to be in a really awkward position. When Wind Waker was first announced back then, I saw it and I said, no. No, no, this isn't a Zelda game, this is a stupid cartoon, what the heck? Where's the realistic looking atmosphere? What did you do, Nintendo? What did you do? 
Yeah, I know, I was a fool. I barely gave this game a shot when I was in sixth grade. It had all the same ideas of Zelda's before, an exploration Dungeons Princess Evil Guy. But all in all, it wasn't the same. And before you crucify me, let me reiterate, I was in sixth grade. Do you know how old you are in sixth grade? You're 11, maybe 12. I was a fool, and I apologize, Zelda. So, as the years went on, Zelda games continued to come out and impress, with various art styles along the way. I've grown to appreciate them all for what they are, realizing that different doesn't always mean bad. And then I turned 23. For my 23rd birthday, my amazing wife bought me a Wii U because she knows how much I love Zelda, and she knew that Wind Waker was being re-released in HD for the Wii U. By the time that happened, I was a lot older and wiser, and excited to really be able to experience this game for myself for the first time. Now, by the time this had happened, I had already played through the first little bit of Wind Waker myself. Up through the Forsaken Fortress, and onto Dragon Roost style, but that was about it. Although I knew the whole story thanks to Let's Plays, and being a generally huge Zelda fan but it still felt like I was experiencing this game for the first time. Maybe it was the HD graphics. Maybe it was the new controller. Maybe it was the bloom lighting. Gosh dang it, Nintendo! Enough bloom lighting for you? As I booted up the game and watched through the opening cutscene, I discovered something about it that stuck with me ever since. A truth I kind of knew already, but seeing it illustrated in this way, I don't think I'll ever forget it. So let's see. Great power, bad guy finds it, good guy beats bad guy, time moves on, bad guy comes back, uh, here we go. The people believed that the Hero of Time would once again come to save them, but the Hero did not appear. Faced by an onslaught of evil, the people could do nothing but appeal to the gods. When I first read this, I almost walked out of the room shaking my head because it's beyond relevance to today. People always try to solve their own problems, always believe in humanity, always try to make things work out for themselves first, and only once have they gotten to a point of absolute horror and helplessness do we finally submit and pray. Why does it take our world falling apart around us to drive us to God in prayer? See, all God wants is a relationship with us. And as any middle schooler can tell you, relationships require communication. Picture an important relationship you have. A best friend, a family member, a boyfriend or girlfriend. Now, imagine what kind of relationship you'd have with them if you never talked to them, or if you only talked to them when you needed something from them. It's kind of like a parasitic relationship, where all you're really doing is using people for your own benefit and not really contributing anything back to them. And while God wants us to have a relationship with us, I don't think that's the kind of one he had in mind when he made us in his image. And sometimes when I talk to people about prayer, I hear the response, I don't know how to pray, or I'm not good at it. I think a lot of that has to do with growing up listening to pastors or other Christians pray. It almost sounds like there's a secret code or some certain words or a strange inflection in your voice to use before your prayers even get to God. But that's not true at all. Just think about what kind of relationship you'd have with God if you spent as much time talking to him as you do your best friend. It'd probably change a lot. One of the best pieces of truth I ever learned is that the Bible never says to preach without ceasing, or to do good deeds without ceasing, or to read the Bible without ceasing, but it does say to pray without ceasing. And I wonder how that would change our lives if we truly talked to God as much as we do anything else. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching the video. I really appreciate you putting the time to watch it and for leaving comments and stuff. You guys are always so nice in my comment section. If there's a way that I can be praying for you, then just make sure you leave a comment and I'll really try my hardest to, to put some time of my day aside to pray for you guys. I know that a lot of times people say, hey, I'll pray for you or I'm praying for you, but we're really not because we just say it to make ourselves feel better. But I will actually try to dedicate a good amount of my time to praying for you guys if there's any way you can. Likewise, if you want to pray for me and for this ministry to get off the ground a little bit, I'd appreciate it. I'm also looking for some help with this ministry a little bit. If you go back to the beginning of the video and you look at the, uh, the little intro clip there, not even, it's not even a clip, it's a still image of my Crosspad Gaming logo, I'm looking to redesign that. But I'm not really good at graphic art, so if you're good at graphic art and you want to make me a new logo and channel art and all that stuff, I can't really afford to pay you, but I'll be your best friend. There's always a bunch of different ways you can help, so if this is something that you really want to get involved in, just send me an email. Uh, email address is down in the description below, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I, what I'm looking for as far as help goes. But if you're looking to help in a way that doesn't cost you any time, energy, or money, then just go ahead and send this video to a friend. Share it on Facebook or Twitter or Tumblr or... Google Plus or whatever, I don't know. I really appreciate the love and support that you guys have shown me so far. It really means a lot to me, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Thanks for watching.
Peace.